Unbroken, Chapter 9, 594 Holes, Part 2. Phil and Cuppernell pushed Superman full throttle for home. The plane was gravely wounded, trying to fly up and over onto its back. It wanted to stall and wouldn't turn, and the pilots needed all their strength to hold it level. Three zeros orbited it, spewing streams of bullets and cannon shells. The gunners, engulfed in scalding hot spent cartridges, fired back. Mitchell in the nose, Pillsbury in the top turret, Glassman in the belly, Lambert in the tail, and Brooks and Douglas standing expo exposed at the broad, open waist windows. Louis, still in the greenhouse, saw rounds ripping through the Zero's fuselages and wings, but the planes were relentless. Bullets streaked through Superman from every direction. In every part of the plane, the sea and sky were visible through gashes in the bomber's skin. Every moment, the holes multiplied. So there's a... Just as Louis turned to leave the greenhouse, he saw a Zero diving straight for Superman's nose. Mitchell and the Zero pilot fi fired simultaneously. Louis and Mitchell felt bullets cutting the air around them, one passing near Mitchell's arm, the other just missing Louis's face. One round sizzled past and struck the turret power line, and the turret went dead. At the same instant, Louis saw the Zero pilot jerk. Mitchell had hit him. For a moment, the Zero continued to speed directly at the nose of Superman. Then, the weight of the stricken pilot on the yoke forced the Zero down, ducking under the bomber. The fighter powered down and splashed into the ocean just short of the beach. Louis rotated the dead turrets by hand and Mitchell climbed out. The gunners kept firing and Superman trembled on. There were still two Zeros circling it. In the top turret, facing backwards, Stanley Pillsbury had fearsome weapons. Twin, 50 caliber machine guns. Each gun could fire 8,000 rounds per minute the bullets traveling about 3,000 feet per second. Pillsbury's guns could kill a man from four miles away and they could take out a zero if given the chance, but the zeros were staying below where Pillsbury couldn't hit them. He could feel their rounds thrumping into Superman's belly, but all he could do was see the plane's wings. Fixated on the nearest zero, Pillsbury thought, if he just come up, I can knock him down. He waited, the plane groaned and shook, the gunners fired, the zeros pounded them from below, and still Pillsbury waited. Then Louis saw a zero swoop up on the right, Pillsbury never saw it. The first he knew of an air-splitting kabang, 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 a sensation of everything tipping and blowing apart in excruciating pain. The Zero had sprayed the entire right side of Superman with cannon shells. The first rounds hit near the tail, spinning the plane hard on the side. Shrapnel tore into its hip and left leg of the tail gunner, Ray Lambert, who hung on sideways as Superman rolled. The plane's twist saved him. A cannon round struck exactly where his head had been on an instant earlier, hitting so close to him that his goggles shattered. Ahead, shrapnel dodged, dropped Brooks and Douglas at the waist guns. In the belly turn, two hunks of shrapnel penetrated the back of Glassman, who was so adre adrenalized that he felt nothing. Another round hit the passenger, Nelson. Finally, a shell blew out the wall in the top turn. Disintegrating, dissing, in, in, disintegrating on impact and shooting metal into Pillsbury, Pillsbury's leg from foot to knee. Half of the crew and all the working gunners had been hit. Superman reeled crazily on its side, and for a moment, it felt about to spiral out of control. Phil and Cooperno re, re, wrenched it level. Clinging to his gun as the shrapnel struck his leg and the plane spin nearly flung him from his seat, Pillsbury shouted the only word that came out. Ow! Louis heard someone scream. When the plane was righted, Phil yelled to him to find out how bad the damage was. Louis climbed from the nose turn. The first thing he saw was Harry Brooks, the Bombay, lying on the catwalk. The Bombay doors were wide open, and Brooks was dangling partway off the catwalk, one hand gripping the catwalk and one leg swinging in the air, with nothing but air and ocean below him. His eyes bulged. His upper body was wet with blood. He lifted one arm toward Louis, a plaintive expression on his face. Louis grabbed Brooks by the wrist and pulled him in a test-seating position. Brooks slumped forward, and Louis could see holes dotting the back of his jacket. There was blood in his hair. Louis dragged Brooks to the flight deck and pulled him into the corner. Brooks passed out. Louis found a cushion and slid it under him, then returned to the bomb bay. He remembered having turned the valve to close the doors and couldn't understand why they were open. Then he saw it. There was a slash in the wall, and purple fluid was splattering everywhere. The hydraulic lines which controlled the doors had been severed. With those lines broken, Phil would have no hydraulic control of the landing gear or the flaps, which means that they would need to slow the plane on landing, and without hydraulics, they had no brakes. 
Louis cranked the Bombay door shut by hand. He looked to the rear and saw Douglas, Lambert, and Nelson lying together, bloody. Douglas and Lambert were pawing along the floor, trying to reach their guns. Nelson didn't move. He'd taken a shot to the stomach. Louis shouted to the cockpit for help. Phil yelled back that he was losing control of the plane and needed Coopernell. Louis said that this was a dire emergency. Phil braced himself with the controls, and Coopernell got up, saw the men in back, and broke into a run. He found morphine, sulfa, oxygen max, and bandages, and dropped down next to each man in turn. Louis knelt beside Brooks, who was still unconscious. Feeling through the gunner's hair, he found two holes in the back of his silk skull. There were four large wounds in his back. Louis strapped an oxygen mask to Brooks' face and bandaged his head. As he worked, he thought about the state of the plane. The waist, nose, and tail gunners were out. The plane was shot to hell. Phil was alone in the cockpit, barely keeping the plane up, and the zeros were still out there. One more pass, he thought, will put us down. Louis was bending over Brooks when he felt a tickle on his shoulder, something dripping. He looked up and saw Pillsbury in the top turn. Blood was streaming from his leg. Louis rushed to him. Pillsbury was still in his seat, facing sideways, gripping the gun and sweeping his eyes around the sky. He looked almost livid. His leg dangled below him, his pant leg hanged in shreds, and his boot blasted. Next to him was a jagged hole the shape of Texas, and almost as large as a beach ball, clawed out the side of the plane. The turret was shot with holes, and the floor was jingling with flakes of metal and turret motor. Louis began doctoring Pillsbury's wounds. Pillsbury, swinging his head back and forth, ignored him. He knew that zero would come. He knew that the zero would come back to finish the kill, and he had to find it. The urgency of the moment drove the pain into a distant place. Suddenly, there was a whoosh of dark clothes upward motion, a gray shining body, a red circle. Pillsbury shouted something unintelligible, and Louis let go of his foot just as Pillsbury banged the high-speed rotor on his turn. The turn grunted to life, whirring Pillsbury around 90 degrees. The zero reached the top of its arc, leveled off, and sped directly towards Superman. Pillsbury was terrified. In an instant, the end would come with the most minute of gestures. With the most minute of gestures, the flick of the Zero's pilot finger on his cannon trigger, and Superman would carry ten men into the Pacific. Pillsbury could see the pilot who would end his life, the tropical sun illuminating his face, a white scarf coiled about his neck. Pillsbury thought, I have to kill this man. Pillsbury sucked in a sharp breath and fired. He watched the tracer skim away from the gun's muzzle and punch through the cockpit of the Zero. The windshield blew apart and the pilot pitched forward. The fatal blow never came to Superman. The Zero pilot, surely seeing the top turn smashed and the waste windows vacant, had probably assumed that the gunners were all dead. He had waited too long. The Zero folded onto itself like a wounded bird. Pillsbury felt sure that the pilot was dead before his plane struck the ocean. The last Zero came up from the below, then faltered and fell. Clarence Douglas, standing at the waste gun with his thigh, with his thigh chest and shoulder torn open, brought it down. In the ocean behind them, the men on the submarine watched the planes tussle over the water. One by one, the Zeros dropped and the bombers flew on. The submarine crew would later report that not one Zero made it back to Nauru. It is believed that thanks to this raid and the others, Japanese never retrieved a single shipment of phosphate from the island. The pain that had been far away during the gunfight surged over at Pillsbury. Louis pushed the release of the turret chair and the gunner slid into his arms. Louis... Louis eased him to the floor next to Brooks, grasping Pillsbury's boot. Pillsbury's boot. He began easing it off gently as he could. Pillsbury hollowed for all he was worth. The boot slid off. Pillsbury's left big toe was gone. It was still in the boot. The toe next to it hung by a single string of skin, and portions of his other toes were missing. So much shrapnel was embedded in his lower leg that it bristled like a pincushion. Louis thought that there would be no way to save the foot. He bandaged Pillsbury, gave him a shot of morphine, fed him a sulfa pill, then hurried away to see if he could save the plane. Superman was dying. Phil couldn't turn it from side to side with the normal controls, and the plane was pulling upward so hard trying to flip that Phil couldn't hold it with his arms. He put both feet on the yoke and pushed as hard as he could. The nose kept rearing up so high that the plane was on the verge of stalling. It was pro proportioning up and down, up and down. The men who could walk rushed through the plane, assessing its condition. The peril of the situ situation was abundantly clear. The right rudder was completely shot, a large portion of it missing and its cables severed. The cables for the elevators, which controlled the plane's pitch, were badly damaged. So were the cables for the trim, which gave the pilot fine control of the plane's attitude, its, its orientation in the air, and thus greatly reduced the effort needed to handle the plane. 
Fuel was trickling onto the floor under the top turret. No one knew the condition of the landing gear, but with the engine plane perforated, it was likely that the tires had been struck. The bomb bay was sloshing with hydraulic fluid. Phil did what he could, slowing the engines on one side, creating a power differential that forced the plane to turn, pushing the plane to higher speed and ease the proportioning and reduce the risk of stalling. If Phil kept his feet on the yoke and pushed hard, he could stop the flame plane from flipping. Someone shut off the fuel feed near Pillsbury and the leakage stopped. Louis took a bomb arming wire and spliced the severed rudder and ele elevator cables together. It didn't result in immediate improvement, but it left the rudder cables failed. It might help. If the rudder cables failed, it might help. Funafuti was five hours away. If Superman could carry them that far, they would have to land without hydraulic control of the landing gear, flaps, or brakes. They could lower the gear and extend the flaps with hand pumps, but there was no manual alternative to hydraulic brakes. Without bombs or much fuel aboard, the plane, uh, fuel aboard, the plane weighed, weighed about 40,000 pounds. A B-24 without brakes, especially one coming in hot over the standard of 90 to 110 miles per hour landing speed, could eat up 10,000 feet before it stopped. Funafuti's runway was 6,660 feet long. At its end were rock and sea. Hours passed. Superman shook and shrugged, struggled. Louis and Capernaum moved along the injured bend. Pillsbury lay on the floor watching his leg bleed. Mitchell hunched over his navigation table, and Phil wrestled with the plane. Douglas limped about, looking deeply traumatized. His shoulder and arm, said Pillsbury, all torn to pieces. Brooks lay next to Pillsbury, blood pooling in his throat, making him gurgle as he breathed. Pillsbury couldn't bear the sound. Once or twice, when Louis knelt before him, Brooks opened his eyes and whispered something. Louis put his ear next to Brooks' lips, but couldn't understand him. Brooks drifted off again. Everyone knew he was almost surely dying. No one spoke of it. It was likely they all knew that they'd crash on landing, if not before. Whatever thoughts each man had, he kept to himself. Whew. Interesting times, huh? Daylight was fading when the planes of Funafuti brushed over the horizon. Phil began dropping the plane toward the runway. They were going much too fast. Someone wanted to hand the crank on the catwalk and open the Bombay doors, and the plane, dragging on the air, began to slow. Douglas went to the pump for the landing gear, just under the top turn. He needed two ants to work it, one to push the valve and one to work the pump, but it was too much pain to hold up either on the arm a few seconds. Pillsbury couldn't stand, but by stretching as far as he could, he reached the selector valve. Together, they got the gear down while Louis peered out the side window, looking for a yellow tab that would signify the gear was locked. The tab appeared. Mitchell and Louis pumped the flaps down. Louis scrounged up parachute cord and went to each injured man, looping cord around him as a belt and wrapping the rope around the stationary parts of the plane. Nelson, with his belly wound, couldn't have a rope around his torso, so Louis fed the line around his arm and under his armpit. Fearing that they'd end up on fire, he didn't knot the cords. Instead, he wound them in the hands of the injured men so they could free themselves easily. The questions of how to stop the bomber remain. Louis had an idea. What if they were to tie two parachutes to the rear of the plane, pitch them out of the waste windows at touchdown, and pull the rip cords. No one had ever tried to stop a bomber in this manner. It was a long shot, but it was all they had. Louis and Douglas placed one parachute in each waste window and tied them to a gun mount. Douglas went to his seat, leaving Louis standing between the waste windows, a rip cord in each hand. Superman sank toward Funafuti. Below, the journalists and the other bomber's crew stood, watching the crippled plane come in. Superman dropped lower and lower. Just before a touchdown, Pillsbury looked at the airspeed gauge. It read 110 miles per hour. For a plane without brakes, it was pretty fast. For a moment, the landing was perfect. The wheels kissed the runway so softly that Louis stayed on his feet. Then came a violent gouging sensation. What they had feared had happened. The left tire was flat. The plane caught hard, veered left, and careened toward two parked bombers. Cooper Nail, surely more out of habit than hope, stomped on the right brake. There was just enough hydraulic fluid left to save them. Save them. Superman spun in a circle and lurched to the stop just clear of the other bombers. Louis was still in the back, gripping the parachute cords. He had no use for them. He had not he had not had to use them. Douglas popped open <laughs> looks like God was really helping and was with them there. He's like, here's a little bit of break for him. Douglas popped open the top hatch, dragged himself onto the roof, raised injured arm over his head and crossed it with the other arm, the signal that there were wounded men inside. Louis jumped down from the bomb bay and gave the same signal. There was a stampede across the airfield, and in seconds the plane was swarming with Marines. Louis stood back and ran his eyes over the body of his ruined plane. Later ground crewmen would count the holes in Superman marking each one with chalk to be sure that they didn't count any twice. There were 594 holes. All of the Nauru bombers had made it back. Every one of them shot up, but none so badly as this.
Brooks was laid on a stretcher, placed in a jeep, and driven to a rudimentary one-room one infirmary. He was bleeding inside his skull. They carried Pillsbury to a barracks to await treatment. He was lying there about an hour later when the doctor came in and asked him if he knew Harry Brooks. Pillsbury said yes. He didn't make it, the doctor said. Technical surgeon Harry Brooks died one week before his 23rd birthday. It took more than a week for word to reach his widowed mother, Edna, at 511 Western Avenue in Clarksville, Michigan. Across town on Harley Road, the news reached his fiancée, Jeanette Birchsker. She learned that he was gone nine days before the wedding date that had set before he left for war. <clears throat> that was um, chapter nine of Laura Hildenbrand's book. It ends uh, very... Chillingly, this world is a very, very hard place. It's a very rough place. And if you can, like, spread any good, do it. Because, like, this guy, like, he was 23, you know, and he died. And uh, his widowed mother was very upset. And his fiance was very upset. He was just a kid, and he didn't have to die. What are they fighting for? We're all human. We're all in this together. Everybody is relevant.